So welcome. Uh, my name is John Lakos. I work at Bloomberg in New York City. Uh, and I have uh, a presentation on modules. I'm not going to tell you when I wrote the slides. Uh, I'll leave that as a surprise. Um, the good news is, is that uh, Nathan Sidwell presented the state of the art uh, of where we are with modules right now as of last week. And I was at that meeting, and I'm pleased to report that we are making great progress. Um, these slides are a little bit older. But the good news also is, is that the requirements for modules, in my mind, haven't changed in a very long time. I'll explain how long that's been. And so uh, I'm going to give you some background to begin with as to what we should expect from modules. And then uh, we'll take the last little bit to look at what the requirements are specifically for the upcoming uh, incorporation into the standard. And then I'll take questions. So with that said, I'm going to get started. I'm going to go really quickly. I have to put this copyright notice up. Here's the abstract, but you're already here, so this is for the viewing audience. What's the problem? Well, we've got this large-scale C++ software thing, and it's got both logical and physical design. You might have noticed that I wrote a book back in 1996. Good news. I am committing right here and now to having the next version of that book done this year. And in fact, I've been spending a lot of time at this conference finishing up the figures and whatever. So I'm still promising by the end of this year, uh, large-scale C++ process and architecture is going to be in hard copy. So having said that again, <laughs> thank you. And it's mostly about modules, by the way. Not kidding. It really is. Um, and so this is the stuff that I put up in every talk, which is that we're going to talk about logical and physical design, but specifically modules are really physical design. And so that's what this talk is about. It's about physical design. And if you recall the 1996 book, it was largely about physical design. The middle part, the sort of the, the beefy part was about that. And the notion of a component and a module, for all intents and purposes, are synonymous. And I've been using components for 25 years. Well, no, more, 30? Long time. So modules are due. Uh, it's true that back in 2007, some people came to me and said, hey, we'd like to work with you on modules. And I said, we don't need modules. We've got components. Why do we need modules? Well, time has passed, and now we need modules. All right. So we're going to just review basic component design. Um, and I'm just going to put this up really quickly without saying all the words, because I know you guys can read. But this is what we're going to go through. And I want to do it because. You can look at all the syntax you want, but if the thing doesn't do what you need it to do architecturally, then it really doesn't matter. So I'm putting this up for you to read. This is the quick version, and then I'm going to move on. So this is what we're going to do. All righty. So here's the outline. Now, I have four parts to this. If I had four hours, I would do parts three and four, but I don't. So we're going to do parts one and two. That's it. So here, this is a component. It's a logical and physical thing. I've drawn like so many of these recently, you can't even imagine. OK, logical is classes and functions. Physical is files and libraries. Here is my iconography. I've got this nice stack of physical things. Those things are modules, by the way. These, these, these fun things right here, that's a module. You'll notice that the, 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 the bobbed corners mean it's a generic module as opposed to a module that has interesting logic in it, because then they would be rounded bubbles. But if they have this, those bobbed corners, they're just like, yeah, it's a module. Um, so it says component, but when you see the word component, just replace it with module. It's too tedious for me to go through and change all my slides to modules. That would require work. So when I say a component, I'm talking about a module. Now, this is the old style component before we had modules, old style module before we had modules. So we called them components. And they had a .h file and a .cpp file. And along with them, so this is the implementation, and then we have the header. And then along with them, they had a single standalone test driver file. Uh, when we have modules, I hope nothing changes. I hope this is still true. There'll be a few little syntactic uh, naming things and whatever that change. But basically, I hope this is still true. The thing is, if it's not true, I won't be able to use modules, and that would be unfortunate. So a module should be able to do pretty much, but not everything a header file can do. The only things that we don't want a module to do is something that's absolutely wrong. So the analogy would be, you know, if there's something that I don't particularly agree with, maybe it's a political thing, you know, maybe I'm in favor or not in favor of the Second Amendment. That's something that smart people can discuss. 
but I don't think we want to keep polio around anymore. So we're going to get rid of those horrible, horrible things that just don't belong for any reason whatsoever. Chemical weapons, no. We're not going to have any of that stuff. And so modules should preclude those things that are so horrible that we just can't have them anymore. We know what they are, and I don't want to say them because somebody might argue with me, so I'm just going to say we're not going to have them. <laughs> but those things are really bad. They, they pass a threshold that if you really want to do that, then you really need to have your head examined. All right. So this is the fundamental unit of design. What is it? It's a module. OK, so here we have a module. And there are four properties to a module. Those four properties have existed since the dawn of time, or at least as long as I've been programming in C++. Um, the first one is that the header file is included as the first substantive line of code. Quickly, does anybody have a reason, know a reason why I would want to do that? Why would I want to include the header file in my CPP file as the first substantive line of code? Yes? Say? Uncover other dependencies. Sounds like a good enough answer given my time frame. The idea is we want a, a when we include something, we want to make sure that that include file compiles in isolation. And if we make it the first line in its own .cpp file, then we know that there's nothing else there. So every time we write something, it compiles in isolation, even if the CPP file would otherwise be empty. So a component has a .h and at least one, but we'll say for now, one .cpp file. It turns out that modules have a .h and a at, it can have more than one module CPP file, but it can't have more than one interface file. So again, everything seems to be mapping exactly onto what we've done forever and ever with components. That's great. All logical constructs having external linkage defined in a .cpp file are declared in the corresponding .h file. This may seem like second nature to some of you. Turns out that as recently as May, I learned something about that. And I've been thinking about this for a long time, and I want to thank Chandler for clearing this up for me. Um, because I learned that every, every definition in C++ is also a declaration. Now, that is meaningless, but I learned it. So you're hearing it now, but forget it, because it's not useful. So I'm telling it, but just forget it. But I'll talk about that in a minute. Uh, a declaration typically introduces a name into a scope, but hyper-technically, every definition is a declaration. But that's not a useful thing to say, because then what's the point? So I'm going to use the term declaration, definition, both. And when I say it's a definition only, that's a lie, but it's a lie only if you're talking about the C++ grammar. What I mean is that a definition doesn't introduce a name, a definition only doesn't introduce a name into a scope. So I'll explain what I mean by that. For our purpose, a declaration introduces a name into a scope. A declaration can introduce something else into a scope, but, but don't worry about it. The, these are the things that make it impossible to have a, a conversation in an elevator. So for our purposes, all right? So let's look at what this means. Int a, is that a declaration or a definition? It's a declaration and a definition, right? If I put that in file scope, it's both. Here, extern int a, declaration or definition? Excellent. Extern int a equals zero. So if you don't say anything, it doesn't have a definition, but what works out to happen kind of, sort of, in some implementations, maybe, is you'll get something. Maybe. What about that? OK. Ah, so this is the lie. It's really a declaration and a definition. However, if you don't have the declaration, it won't compile. So even though it's a declaration and definition, it isn't. <laughs> so I'm going to stand by it's a definition only. If anybody has a problem with it, argue with Chandler, not me. 
Alrighty. So, is this internal or external linkage? At file scope, it's external linkage. What about this? And this? And this? So that's interesting, right? Used to be a long time ago when I had more hair. It used to be internal and problematic and all kinds of things because at one point it was a it was the seafront preprocessor kind of thing. But now it's for real, it's just we inline it and the compiler people have to do some more work. Uh, what about this? And what about this? And this? What about this? This? And this? This? Trick question. This? 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 And this? And this? Doesn't compile, why? Why doesn't it compile? So, what if we get rid of that? Then it's internal linkage, right? If you know this without checking the standard, if you like know all of this stuff like totally, then you're better than everybody because this is really hard stuff sometimes, but it doesn't matter. What if I get rid of that? Very good. All right, you now know what I mean by those terms. Actually, let me go back and explain with you. All constructs having external linkage defined in the .cpp file are declared in the corresponding .h file. What that means is if you have something that is a definition in your component, uh, and it has external linkage, which means it could affect something outside your module, then it must be declared in your module. And the current, everything that we're talking about right now in modules does that. That, that will not happen otherwise. That's good news. Every construct with external linking, linkage, ah, every construct having external or dual bindage declared in the .h file, if defined at all, are defined within the component. What the heck is bindage? Can you find that in the standard? Yeah, I made it up. So I'll tell you what it means. So what's are some examples? So bindage, anything that the compiler does to bind things, if the compiler does it, it's internal bindage. If the linker does it exclusively, it's external bindage. And if either the compiler or the linker could do it, then it has dual bindage. So what's an example of internal bindage? Anybody? How about a type def? If I have a type def declaration, the binding of the name to its structural definition has internal bindage because it's being bound. The name is being bound to its definition by the compiler. Does that make sense? Okay. It's not linkage. It's not the same thing as linkage. It's bindage. It's tool-based and if the linker's going to do it, for example, I have a function, a plain old C style function. The linker deals with that, right? You got a name, you declare it in the header file, the client uses it, you get an undefined symbol. Then somewhere you have a definition, there's a symbol definition, the dados get mixed together, and then the linker comes along and puts the two together and binds them. That's external linkage. Now, bindage, thank you. 
My buddy Pablo is keeping me honest. Too much coffee. So, bindage, not linkage. Linkage is a standard term. It has standard meaning. It has nothing to do with tools. Bindage has everything to do with tools and nothing to do with standard. And yet, the two go together very nicely, it turns out. Can you tell me two constructs in the language that typically, and by typically I mean always, have external and internal dual bindage? What's a construct other than Pablo, because I know he knows? Templates. Templates is one. What's the other one? Macros do not have anything to do with this. They're not part of C++. They're, they're pre-processing step. Leave them out. If they had anything, they would have preprocessor bindage. Not types. Some kind of function. Inline functions. Inline functions and templates behave the same way when you look under the hood. Right? OK, so there, there are instances of the function in every dot O, and then the linker comes along and deals with it, unless the inline function gets inline directly. By the way, both templates and inline functions can be inlined. The reason for having the inline keyword is not what everybody thinks these days. It's to enable it to live in the header so that it can be seen by the other compiler without violating the one definition rule. Contrary to proper, a popular belief, if you put the word inline in front of a template function, the compiler is more likely to inline it than if you don't. So it does mean something. And the person I learned that from is sitting in the front row here, Pablo, and he told me about that in about 2004. So that was before I wrote these slides, by the way. Um, <clears throat> what was the point of this? Oh, yes. All constructs having external or dual bindage declared in a .h file if defined at all or defined in the component. What does that mean? And that means if I declare it and the linker could get involved, which is pretty much everything except the forward class declaration. I say forward class declaration for a reason. A forward declaration implies that the, the definition is coming in this translation unit. If it turns out that that's not happening, we don't call it a forward class declaration or forward anything declaration. We call it a local declaration. Local declarations that are not forward declarations are bad things. So if you declare a class, there are issues with doing that. But if you declare a function locally, you're a, a, that's a problem. Because now what can happen is you no longer have a neighborhood for the, the, the client to, to say, oh, look, I'm using this in the context of this header file. It doesn't match compiler tell me. Or I'm defining this in the context of this header file. It doesn't match compiler tell me. What you have is you have a link time error. Link time errors are brittle and bad, and we won't do them. And then finally, we use components pretty much exclusively to gain access to functionality, meaning that we don't try to use declarations. In general, when we need to use functionality at all, instead of repeating it, we pound include or import what it is that we need. Nothing's changed in a very long time. These slides were written a long time ago. Does anybody have a guess as to how long ago I wrote these slides? I'm not going to tell you now. Anyway, this is my iconography. I'm just putting it up here. These things are modules but they were written as components. You'll notice there are classes in there, and you'll notice that one of the components has two classes, and one of the classes has an underscore. The underscore means that it's private to the component, but it's just a convention today, but it works just fine. We like that. We don't like making the, the class a nested class, because all kinds of bad things happen when you nest classes in classes, all kinds of weirdness and friendships and strangeness and diagrams don't look good and you have to think really hard and the indentation is horrible. So this is good. Turns out that, that when we get our modules together, this will all be implemented naturally just by accident. Total accident. Pure coincidence that this is the way I've done things since 1990 something. So is a, a polygon is a shape. Now normally we wouldn't have a value semantic type implementing an abstract interface because what does that even mean? But that's another talk. But for the purpose of intuition, let's assume shape's an abstract interface. Polygon is what you think. And we have a uses in the interface relationship that says that polygon uses point in the interface, for example, to add a vertex. Something uses something, in, a function uses something in the interface uh, if, if it names it as part of its signature or return type. Um, now, uh, if it, we look at point list and point list link, both of them use 
point in their interface, clearly. Now, even though point list link is not part of the public, uh, 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 is not accessible programmatically from outside, which is what we mean, nonetheless, it still uses point in its own interface. Uh, then we have this notion of users in the implementation. A polygon might have, as a data member, a point list, and so it's not programmatically accessible. If it's not programmatically accessible, I could take that out and put something else in, and everything would work just fine. Except that the client, the client might have included polygon, and polygon might include point list, and, and the client might go, oh look, I have access to a point list, so I'm gonna use a point list somewhere else. That's called the transitive include. If we change the point list to do something else, to be something else, let's say I use a STD vector. Now I don't have my point list, so I take the point list pound include out of my header file for polygon, and what happens? I break my client. My client was relying on that implementation detail in a very nefarious, insidious, nasty way. It would be nice if modules took care of that. They do. Point list include, uh, uses point list link in its implementation. Nowhere outside of, of this module can you, if you have access to point list, would you be able to know that the point list link is being used? But wouldn't it be nice if we had a view where that was visible and we could say that it wasn't? In other words, suppose there were a function that actually gave you the point list link for some purpose inside the component, but not for external use. Let's say you wanted to do that. Wouldn't it be nice if we could expose only the subset of methods we want ported out externally? Turns out that that's an incredibly useful thing to do for many, many reasons. It's not currently proposed. It's not currently blocked. Write your congressperson. Before modules are done, that ability must exist. Okay. And finally, we have uses in name only, which is, mean, is kind of a, a strange thing because it doesn't imply a physical dependency. So shape, which being an abstract class, has something called origin, and I can get the origin of the shape abstractly, and it's returned by value. But just because it's returned by value does not mean that you need to know its size because it's an abstract interface. And in fact, uh, this is a general property. Just because something is used passed in by value or returned by value, you, as a client, don't need to know its size unless you call the function. So this is news, I'm sure, but it's okay. So we use this special symbol. This is uses in name only. And uses in name only means that I can build the entire thing and test it without ever having known the definition, without ever having included the header. And then we have this thing called depends on. Depends on is the fat arrow when it goes from box to box. Boxes are physical entities. The inheritance arrow is bubble to bubble. Those are logical entities. So a polygon depends on shape. A polygon, because of this, uses in the interface, a polygon. We know this just from the symbols, by the way. It's explained in the 1996 book, but it's also explained in the 2018 book. So either one, uh, you can have this explained and why it's true. But those logical symbols imply physical dependencies between the physical entities that contain them. So this is good to know. All right, level numbers. Once you have those physical dependencies, disregard the logical, we go up a level, we can assign level numbers. If something doesn't depend on anything else, it's at level one, locally. By depends on, I mean locally. Okay, because shape depends on point in name only, it doesn't actually depend on it, it's also at level one. However, we have something else that depends on point, it's at level two, and polygon, Although it depends on point and shape, it also depends on point list, so it's at level three. Hope that makes sense. Central physical design rules, there are two. Somebody tell me quickly, I have 35 minutes. What are the two most important design rules? Yes, no circular dependencies. What's the other one? Also very important. Really? Really? Oh. No long distance friendship. No one should be able to, from outside, reach into a module and grab something that's supposedly an empty tail of a module. Does anybody disagree with that? That's been a rule forever. Go look at the 1996 book. Those are the two most important rules. And the third one, third most important rule is no transitive includes because it's brittle and it breaks large systems. One, two, and three. 
modules address all of them. When do you put two public classes in the same component? It's an important design consideration. All of this is covered in the 2018 book, by the way. So there are four. One of them is friendship, of course. You have an iterator in its container, they go in the same component. Another one is cyclic dependencies. They almost never happen, but there are rare cases with, with templates that depend on each other where they do need to do that. And so there are reasons for doing that, but they are rare and they're specialized and they're typically compile time-ish like parsing tree thingies. But they exist, but they're very rare. Very rare in my experience. Super rare. Single solution, what does that mean? Well, before we had variadic templates and those things, we would have approximations to them which had multiple syntactic elements that together, although they didn't depend on each other, together they conspired to give you a single solution. Don't confuse it with hierarchical solutions. Suppose I have a point, a coordinate, a box, a box collection, and a garage. Now you might say, wait a minute, how can I possibly do anything with a box collection if I don't have a box? So I'm gonna put the box in with the box collection. What's wrong with that? Somebody. You can use the box by itself without the box collection, and that's a reasonable thing to do. So just because you have something complex that needs something simple, that's not a reason to put the simple thing in with the complex thing, because the simple thing is hierarchically reusable somewhere else. Does that make sense? So this is a bad idea. Instead, we'll use this thing independently, and maybe we'll use those two things independently, and maybe these three things independently, and maybe all four of those things independently. We don't need a garage. Even though all of these things could be put in the garage module, we're not gonna do that. We're gonna put them in separate modules. There's no charge for having separate modules. They do not, they don't charge by the module. In fact, there's an extraordinarily strong argument to use class categories something that Herb Sutter has been talking a lot about recently. He calls it something else. Um, but these class categories, which have existed uh, and we've used at Bloomberg extensively and were clarified around 2011, and they are in our uh, taxonomy. You can go to our website, uh, uh, Bloomberg, and you can see our taxonomy. There are different categories of things. Uh, and anyway, um, well, let me move on. So this is fine. The, the last one is flea on an elephant, and what does that mean? If you have a flea and you put it in with the elephant, no one's going to care. And an example of this might be, for example, if you have a logger and you need a scoped guard to activate the logger in Maine, you say, logger, create, whatever it is. That's a little bit of sugar that gets something going. It doesn't change the dependencies. It doesn't change anything other than provide a needed piece in a welcome usage example in the module. Every module should have a usage example. Maybe multiple usage examples, but at least one. On the other hand, if you have a flea and you try to stuff an elephant in there, people will notice. And we need to be careful that this can be abused. This is no good. Of course we don't do that, but as Pablo suggested, an abuse alert might be appropriate because you can rationalize Almost anything. You could say, well, it's not a flea, a flea and an elephant, but it's not an elephant and a flea. Maybe it's a dog and a goat, you know, or something like that. No, it, it's really got to be, you know, a, a flea and an elephant. If it isn't, don't do it. So now I'm going to quickly talk about the other side of the physical coin, which is insulation. So encapsulation, an implementation detail of a component, type, data, or function that can be altered, added, or removed without forcing clients to rework their code is said to be encapsulated. Technically encapsulated means that the functions and the data are in the same capsule. That the data is private is data hiding, but people leave that out and they say it's encapsulated to mean it's hidden. It's together and the data is hidden. An implementation detail of a component type, data, or function that can be altered, added, or removed without forcing clients to recompile is said to be insulated. What that means is it's, it's not the same. It's not necessarily a stronger condition, but it is a stronger condition. It's saying that I can actually make this change and my clients don't even have to recompile. People have heard of the pimple idiom. 
The pimple idiom is designed to insulate the impel from the client. In 1996, we called that a fully insulating concrete class. You can look at the book. But I later found out it's called pimple. Not sure when the term was coined. All right, so here is a very rare case where I have dependencies pointing up. I don't know why they're pointing up, but they are, and I was too lazy to change the slide. It's an old slide, by the way. Did I mention this is an old slide? Okay. So the dependencies are pointing up, but it seems to work better. So here's the client, and the client is, in, oh, I know why, because this is includes, and people think of includes like that. Think of this as one piece of paper, maybe. So anyway, so this is a library component. So I have a client and a library component, and the client component depends on the library component in a very specific way. It includes its header in its CPP file. That's what's happening. Now, depending on the library component, it might depend on something like an empty tail D. So D is an empty tail, but it's included in the header file, which means that if I make a change to the header file of D, that will go flow right through to A, because it's going to flow through C's header file to A. That means that I need to recompile C, and I need to recompile A. OK? Whereas, so D is encapsulated by C, and what we really mean is the use of D is encapsulated by C. The use of D, because D is not contained, it's used. This is important. For hierarchical reuse to be successful, we can't hide the implementation details of the implementation details of the implementation details of what we're building. So they all have to be publicly accessible, but their use is encapsulated. On the other hand, this guy is included in the .cpp file. So if that changes, it flows through to here, that needs to recompile, and we're done does not affect the client. The client does not have to recompile. Do you see the difference between, when we say module, right? The code is modularized. It's hidden. It's encapsulated. But is it insulated? Who knows whether it's insulated or not? Is it totally insulated, partially insulated, not insulated, one little tiny stinking what do you think? <laughs> I have a vote for partially insulated. When I go to modules, when I take something that would be module compatible instead of a component and I move it to a module, we know what happens with the, with the private classes. The private classes that had the extra underscore, they won't be visible because they're not exported. We know the header file that was used won't be visible because it won't be accessible either. It will be completely local to the module because it's not exported. But what about something that is exported? What? What about templates? The question is, what is, what is, what is being hidden? What implementation details can a module hide? So if I have, for example, a box, and a box consists of two points, and the point is private to the module. It's just, it's just used as data members of the, of, the, uh, of the box. If I go, if I do the header file thing, I have to know the size of the points. But if I do the module thing, do I have to know the size of the points? Yes. So the, the sad fact is no matter what we do with modules, it will have absolutely nothing at all to do with insulation, which means pimple lives the same way it always did. Anything that you ever did to try to reduce compile time compilation in the traditional way will be left alone. Now, that's not to say we can't have pre-compiled modules the same way we have pre-compiled header files. But that's not part of the standard. The point is, is that what modules give you architecturally is no different from that perspective than what header files give you. I just want to be clear on that. From an architectural point of view, from a build point of view, that's a different story, okay? 
So the use of E is insulated by C. That's important. We can take the thing out, we can put something else in, and life is good. So criteria for having a, including a .h file. A header file must be self-sufficient with respect to compilation. I think we can agree on that. You shouldn't have to include something before you include a header file, right? You should just be, I'm including this header file. It should compile, yes? Okay, no one would disagree with that. So there are five reasons. Is a, if something is a something else, then you know for a fact that you're gonna need to know what that thing is. Is is one of the strongest dependencies. So is a, in fact, is the one thing that we can say, if I am a, if I'm a, um, a polygon, and I know that polygon is a shape, I don't have to include shape. I know that polygon is gonna include shape. That's a given, that's the one exception. Every other kind of uses, you include it. If you use it, you include it or import it. Has a, if I has a something, then I'm gonna to need to put it in the header file because that's necessary. Now in modules, that won't be necessary if it's not used elsewhere. So that's a good thing. What about what's another one? There are five. So it turns out not uses. So here we have an example. I've got const point ref. I do not include, for this reason, I do not include point.h. I say class point. I don't need to include it. It's not necessary. What about that point? Do I need to include it here? So I already said no. Somebody wasn't listening. No, you don't need to include it. And I know you don't believe me, and I want you to go right outside and check it. Or if you have something portable, check it now. No, you don't. You don't need to include it just because it's declared there. It's only if you call the function. All right. So inline. If I have a body of an inline function, and you happen to be using a, a compiler that looks into uh, uh, even uh, uh, templates or whatever, anything that's in the header file or whatever that could be looked at to see if it makes sense, of course, you want to make sure that that's uh, included so you can see it. All right, enum. Um, until recently, C++ 11 recently, uh, enums had to be included. Now we can actually, we can do something where we allied the enumeration. That is a whole can of worms of its own, and I'm not going to go into it now, but be warned, if you're using one of those newfangled enumerations that allow you to align the enumerators and you think you're doing somebody a favor, be very careful. I'll just say be very careful because it's tricky. Uh, and the fifth one is a type def, typically like string, SDD string. Um, those kinds of things, we can't forward declare them. We're not supposed to forward declare uh, standard templates because they can put in optional arguments and then it's no longer compatible, so there are strong suggestions not to do that. So the bottom line is there are a few routine cases that I learned a new word recently. It's called quotidian, so quotidian cases, everyday cases where we do this. And there's some other strange ones like covariant return types and, and whatever. And so. Uh, these are the examples where we do it, but if it's not one of these, don't do it unless you have a good reason. The real reason to do it is to make sure that your header file compiles in isolation, and if you're not doing it for that reason, don't do it. Any questions on this? All right, here's some questions. No. The question is, where did we have it? Was it here? It was here. This one. This one. Yes, right here. Repeat the question. Okay, the question is, what is the question? Repeat the question. Can you take the point by value and also provide that? This one? Yeah. Yes. I can do this. Check it. If you don't use it. If you use it, include it. Remember, if you use it, include it. If you use it, import it. Same thing. Okay. What's the question? I'll repeat it, go ahead. Yes. If you have an inline function body, obviously you're gonna have to pound include the header file. You can't forward declare the inline function body. Okay. So back to these questions. So let's pick one. 
How do I extract a component dependencies effectively? How does one do that? I was doing this back in the early 90s before we had Clang. How did I do it? What? Remove one header, compile it. That sounds very painful. Say again, a lie? Analyze the headers, but I, ha I didn't have Clang back in the 90s. How did I do it? Grep. I grep for what? Grep for include. So basically, if I follow the rules that I told you about that modules will enforce, by the way, by accident, if we follow those rules, all we need to do is look at the import statements of the modules and we can infer the envelope of physical dependencies. Who knew? That could be done 10,000 times faster than running a Clang program, which means it's scalable, which means we can do it for the largest programs very quickly using a Perl or Python script. Right? Tiny. Tiny script. All right. So why would we put an include directive in an include? Just checking. Does anybody know what the reason is? The reason. There you go. So it compiles, its, it's uh, include order is, is independent. We get rid of include order dependencies. And finally, what's the cost benefit associated with insulation? If insulation is so good, why don't we always insulate our code? Okay, one, it's verbose. What's another reason? Inheritance. I'm not sure I understand that one. Indirection, and what's the result of indirection? Performance. So often, if you fully insulate something, it's going to be slower. But there are awesome partial insulation techniques where you can find the sweet spot and insulate just that. And if you think about a stack, where's the one place where you want the insulation? The part of push that has to grow the container. So if you have one function that says, I'm not big enough, find me some more space and make it private, and put all that code in the .cpp file, and all the includes associated with it, you get the insulation, and when it turns out that that was a bad idea and you want to change it, none of your clients have to recompile, and everything else runs as fast as possible. And it's an awesome, awesome technique, partial insulation technique. Strongly recommend it. Lakos 2018. All right. So let's get to the part that we're supposed to be talking about. I'm not as far ahead as I wanted to. So I'm just going to tell you about the requirements. I've been putting them into the talk as we went. Um, it's a critically needed language feature now. It wasn't, in my opinion, 15 years ago because we had components. But enough has been put into the header files now that we need to worry about it. Um, there's a lot of stuff we want to clean up. As recently as last week, Bjorn Strustrup informed us at the module meeting that was here uh, that, that uh, people are receptive to the idea that modules are not going to be 100% compatible with the worst of the worst code that's ever been written. So it isn't going to be the goal, and it, it absolutely promise you it is not Bloomberg's goal, to take existing legacy code and jam it into modules. That is not the purpose. We have no interest in doing that. What we have interest in doing is taking modules and making them capable of doing all the awesome work we want to do and translating that which is out of date or really badly designed into something that's viable. So it's, uh, if we make modules too restrictive so that we can't do what we need to do to do our jobs, we failed. If we also make modules so general that the worst of the worst code gets in and thereby uh, 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 harms the greater society, if you will, like saying, oh, sure, long distance friendship, uh, cyclic dependencies. Yeah, we're not even going to help you with transitive includes. No, that's your problem. We have again failed. So we need to have all of the major design rules that have been proven over 20 years to say enough. What? Enough is enough. And, and we're gonna and we're gonna make that change. So those only those very, very, very well understood changes where we're not going to allow things that are absolutely wrong, those things we're gonna fix. But other than that, anything that's plausible, anything that we need to do our jobs, anything that even doesn't even matter whether I agree or not. As long as, as long as there is an argument to do it, and that there is a business need somewhere to do it, then yes, it should be supported. 
but if there's absolutely no reason to support it other than it is a bug and should be fixed, we don't need to support that. Now, the thing is, the other thing, if you went to um, Nathan Sidwell's talk uh, earlier this week, and you can catch it on the video because we don't have a time travel machine yet, or you would have already seen it. Um, anyway, that, that talk talks about the latest and greatest uh, enhancements, a little bit more about the syntax, a little bit more about, about uh, what it looks like to write modules and those kinds of things. It's very up to date with the proposals. This talk and this particular slide, the, this, this paper that I wrote, it, I think it was 2000, was 2017. My goodness, it was about uh, 20 months ago. I wrote this very quickly in ASCII. It's, it's uncharacteristic that I actually published stuff like this. This is the actual paper, Business Requirements for Modules. This hasn't changed, in my mind, in many, many years. Uh, it's not about performance. It's about providing a better architectural piece for C++ development. The performance will come. I look at performance as small rocks compared to the big rocks of having the right properties. If we worry about performance now and we don't get the properties right, we've lost an opportunity that comes once in a generation. So it is my goal to make sure that we preserve all of the good properties, much the way that we wanted to get concepts right. We really need to get modules right. And we're moving in the right direction. I question strongly whether we're getting there fast enough to have it in 20. We will have it proven at scale in 2023. And Bloomberg has made a monumental commitment to make sure that happens by doing our own prototyping ourselves. So, there's a lot of work that's been done. As I said, this is a paper from 2017, and a lot of work has been done by then, but I'm going to encourage everybody that we don't want to run ahead and do modules so quickly to get the performance benefit that we miss out on the other opportunities. So there are four points that I want to make. There's purely additive, which is what modules need to be. There's hierarchical, incremental, and interoperable. By purely additive, I mean I should not have to change one line of my legacy code base in order to start using modules and integrate it. If I add modules, it should affect none of my legacy code base. That's hierarchical. It should be incremental. Any group in my company could start to use modules, and it wouldn't, it wouldn't be a problem with anybody else who's writing new code. They can use it or not. And finally, interoperable. If I have a client and they want to consume modules, but they also want to include old header files, and let's say both of them depend on something at a lower level, there's no one definition rule violation at all. So those are requirements. So logical versus physical encapsulation. Right now, if we have private data, we have to pound include the private data's header file. That needs to be addressed in modules so that we don't have the transitive includes. That's very important. Uh, another one is with the advent of contracts, which is something that Bloomberg has worked very, very hard to make sure happen. The level at which we do defensive checks, precondition checks, postcondition checks, and whatever, should be able to be controlled by the module and not be affected by the client consuming the module. This is an important property that does not exist for inline functions and templates in standard translation units. Modules need to fix that. We need to address that. It is not fully addressed yet. We need to make that happen. Many people try to, in the object-oriented world, try to do things like procedural interfaces where I can give a client a view of my system. Wouldn't it be nice if we had a modular view that said, here's my subsystem, it's under construction, you didn't pay me enough, I'm going to give you a subset of the functionality, and I want to do that at a per member function basis so that I can have a poor man's encapsulation, so that when I finally come time and I figured out what I'm doing over here, uh, then I can say, okay, here's the whole thing, it's stable. So I'm providing you what's called a stable view, but over here I've got some people that are much more tolerant, that are closer to me, that I can trust, I give them a, a different view of my system. Then at one fine day, there's somebody up there that wants the work that they're doing and the work that they're doing, and they're sitting up here. Now we have to unite two views. Imagine you have a, uh, an STD vector. One has a push uh, back, one has a pop back, but they don't have the other function. The guy up there that in includes both views gets both functionalities, gets the union of the capabilities. This is the kind of functionality that modules can provide and will stop people from wrapping things. Has anybody ever tried to wrap something 
you lose performance. It's a big pain in the butt. It's a maintenance nightmare. It's a lot of crufty code. There's no reason for that. So by just having views, we will be able to achieve something that people try to achieve in practice. Um, and that is uh, why I mentioned the C procedural interface thing, which I got ahead of myself a bit on. So uh, real world scenario, just to run through it, I might have uh, something that looks like this. This is mostly for the, for the audience uh, at home so they can read all the text. But you can imagine that I might come along and I might want to add a, a system that, that's a module-based system that uses a, a library module-based system. And then later, maybe I want to have a client that uses that library module-based system and also some legacy header. And both of them use some legacy header. This should be possible. Um, this was actually in the talk as described. I mean, as in the paper when I wrote it. Um, so I'm putting this up there. But since I'm low on time, I don't want to answer questions. A year ago, there was a lot of emphasis on caching. And we know from experience with the template repositories that if we put caching into the standard, we will be doing ourselves a huge uh, disservice. We want to maintain the embarrassingly parallel nature of individual translation units so that anybody, if I happen to have 10,000 machines and I want to build each module independently, I will get maximum performance gain by doing that as opposed to forcing the lowest level to create some artifact and then have the second level create some artifact. In fact, what we're getting is build time levelization of our system. And you can just imagine what would happen if the system weren't levelizable. Oh my goodness. OK. We don't want to do that. We want to make sure that everything is buildable in an embarrassingly parable way. Once we, uh, parallel way. Once we have that, the natural consequence is that compiler developers will make it fast. They can't help it. They will. That will happen. But there's an order to things. Big rocks first, then small rocks, then sand, then water. I'm not going to say that the performance is water, but it is not a big rock. Um, there are many different competing ideas around this. So we, we really, what I'm basically saying is uh, there's a lot going on. I have about eight minutes left, so I'm going to just quickly review what's going on with modules in big font. We do want to reduce compilation time. We do want to reduce but not eradicate macros. That's a misconception. Macros are necessary for prototyping language features and for things like loggers and for things like assertion levels and, and, and such. Uh, it was necessary to have macros in order to do that. It will continue to be necessary to have macros to do prototyping. And I do not know how today to write a logger without a macro. And I'm pretty sure it can't be done. We have a very nice logger that you can look at. It's the B-A-L-L -L logger. And it's available open source. I suggest you take a look at it. it. It is our style of programming. And it's been around for 15 years. And it's battle tested. And it's awesome. Uh, but it uses macros. And we can't write a module system that doesn't allow that to be modularized. Cannot happen. Uh, we can't use it. I mean, it's just a fact. It's not like we're being you know, sniggly. That's throughout our code base. We have to be able to do that. So I put this thing up here uh, reminding us what uh, Additive, hierarchical, incremental, and interoperable mean. But you've already seen it, so you can go to the video. Uh, I want to rem remind you of these things. I already said this stuff, so I don't need to repeat it. So again, this is the idea that over time, we'll add things. The red things are modules, and that can happen. And that can happen. And then I can do that. And then I can add, I do that if I want to. And then I can decide I didn't want to do it. And then I can add that. And then later I can go do that if I want to. There should be no reason I can't go back and forth and do that. So in other words, purely additive, incremental, hierarchical, and physically modular are the things I'm trying to get at. And um, we don't want to do this prematurely. Um, requiring centralized repositories is a bad idea. Uh, I already said that. And I'm still going to argue it may be too soon, even with all the progress, to get this into C20. But I will try to keep an open mind. And as, what I'm really trying to do is make sure that we don't make any missteps. So if we put something in that's too small, but we've got it right, I don't have a problem with that. My big problem is if we try to put something in that's too small, and we don't have a plausible rest of the puzzle pieces to make it work. And with that, I have 
five minutes left, I'm sorry. Uh, so I'll just go with questions. But this is actually, what are the engineering requirements of modules? I'll leave that out, I'll just leave it with questions. Questions? You didn't say how old your slides are. Oh. <laughs> All right, fair enough. So does anybody want to guess when I, the first part of the talk? I presented those slides somewhere. Does anybody want to guess? And, and by the way, when I presented those slides, uh, I actually had older slides that were very similar. But those particular slides, with a couple of updates, when do you think the date was that I presented them? It was ACCU. 96, nice guess. No, not quite that long ago. I remember the date. It was part of a larger talk. All right, the answer is 2009. So these are nine-year-old slides. Nothing's changed. Just changed component to module. It's the same concept. Excuse the overload. OK, thanks for asking. So you mentioned that it's not possible to write a logger without macros. So would there be some sort of construct that could be added to the language so you could write a logger without macros? OK, so the question, which you just said, it's on the mic. The, the question being, could we write, add something to the language, I presume other than macros, to allow it, the, uh, something to be written? And yes, there, there are lazy expressions, I've been told, that are key to doing that. But then you'd still need to have some zero cost way of putting it all together. So if you combine like a const expert with a lazy evaluation with the this, that, and the other thing. But the real problem is when we try to write something, if we're not going to log it, it needs to not be there. So there, the evaluation of the parameters to the logging function can't be evaluated until you've decided that you're going to log it, and that's a runtime thing. And that's why macros are important, if that makes sense. And then configuring the syntax so that it's as easy as possible to do that. But of course, if we were to come up with a, a dedicated syntax for that purpose or something similar to that, or the piece parts that would allow us to assemble that, then yes, of course, it can be done. Right, so you mentioned getting rid of um, at least exposing transitive dependencies. Uh, which is a big design goal of modules, uh, and thank you for that, that's awesome. Um, but does that basically mean that a module exposes a much wider interface to the linker than it does to, you know, the users of the module? I think, you, okay. you have a whole bunch of unutterable things. Okay, so, so the point is, is that what we get is we kind of get three different views. We used to have, you either didn't get to see it at all because the, compi the client compiler didn't get to see it, or you get everything. So what we're going to have is an in-between where the client compiler can see the code, but the client can't. The client can't create a new one. So I can't create an instance of point, but I can use the box, which itself has access to. So, so indirectly, I can use it. But that solves the transitive include problem. Did I? Did I? Yeah. I did it? OK, good. Good question. Thank you for clarifying that for me. I think you did that for my benefit, not yours. <laughs> Any other questions? Well, all right, then we have a minute and 25 seconds left over. That's a first. All right, well, thank you all for coming. Enjoy. <laughs>